chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. I'm delighted you're here because uh, I love this passage of Scripture, and I believe I, I'm just I'm very thankful you're here to hear it. And I want to share some thoughts on it. And as you're leaving today, you're welcome to share thoughts with me as well. Uh, not during the midst of the sermon, if you don't mind. But you know. <laughs> so Luke chapter eight. The first grade school teacher told her pastor an interesting story as the school year got underway. The mother of a first grade girl visited her before school and the mother wanted to tell the teacher that the girl had open heart surgery that summer. Therefore, she would both desire and deserve a little extra care. And the mother went on to say that the little girl had accepted Christ as her savior. She was baptized shortly before the surgery. And of course, the little girl was apprehensive about the surgery but she uh, managed to keep a lot of the fears to herself. But finally, the day before the surgery, the surgeon again met with the child and explained what he was going to do, and the girl seemed a little upset. So the doctor inquired about what was bothering her, and she said, well, I just accepted Christ as my savior. Would you promise that you'll not let him out? <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, the physician replied, Sweetheart, if Jesus is in your heart, there's no way anyone can get him out of your heart. <laughs> so, and there isn't. I believe once you've truly accepted Christ as your Savior, that you are forgiven. All of your sins, past, present, and future. But I also have a concern that there are people who think they are believers in Christ when they're not. And that's part of what this passage is about. So, Luke chapter 8, Jesus describes four kinds of listeners in this passage, and he says some other things too. Let's begin in chapter 8, verse 4. When a large crowd was coming together and those from the various cities were journeying to him, he spoke by way of a parable. The sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell beside the road, and it was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky soil, and as soon as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it out. Other seed fell into the good soil and grew up and produced a crop a hundred times as great. As he said these things, he would call out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. His disciples began questioning him as to what this parable meant. And he said, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is in parables, so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Those beside the road are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart so that they will not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no firm root. They believe for a while, and in time of temptation, fall away. The seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard, and as they go on their way, they are choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life, and bring no fruit to maturity. But the seed in the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart, and hold it fast, and bear fruit, with perseverance. Now no one, after lighting a lamp, covers it over with a container or puts it under a bed, but he puts it on a lampstand so that those who come in may see the light. For nothing is hidden that will not become evident, nor anything secret that will not be known and come to light. So take care how you listen, for whoever has, to him more shall be given, and whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has shall be taken away from him. Now we enter here a section of the Gospels in which Jesus uses more and more parables to explain the truth. Now why is this? Well, I think there's a couple of reasons. Quite simply, the parable stimulates curiosity. You see, the disciples right afterwards would ask him, what does this parable mean? What does this teaching mean? 
the parable stimulates curiosity. Also, though, it left others bewildered who really didn't want to know the truth. If you wanted to know the truth, this parable would stimulate your curiosity so you would want to know what Jesus is teaching. But if you really didn't want to know, then you're not going to know. So this parable teases the mind to think. Also, here's another thing about parables. They help us to remember. Uh, you've probably all read the Sermon on the Mount. I doubt you could quote it to me verse for word, you know, word for word. And if you, uh, if you could even tell me the gist of the Sermon on the Mount, you know, what it's about and the main sections, I'd be kind of impressed. But if I ask you, what is the, the parable of the Good Samaritan? No, I don't think anyone here would have a problem telling me. We tend, to rem we tend to remember stories. And Jesus used these stories, these parables. The word parable means literally casting alongside. So what Jesus does is he takes some earthly situation, generally, and he casts it along a spiritual truth. Back in that day, everyone planted seeds. So they knew, they knew what he was talking about. And so he took that earthly reality everyone was familiar with to explain a spiritual reality. Now in verse 10, Jesus says, it's been granted for his disciples to know the mysteries of the kingdom. Those who sought Christ and those today who seek Christ with all their heart can know, will know, the mysteries of the kingdom. I believe Jesus wanted all people to come to know the truth. And those who really want to know the truth, God will take his word and illumine their minds and help them to understand it. But there are some people who do not want to know the truth. Their minds are blinded. The Spirit of God can reveal truth to people but some hearts are blinded, some minds are blinded. In other words, whether or not you accept the truth depends to a great extent upon you. You're the soil, you and I. So, you know, a person can actually dwell in darkness when the land is full of sunshine. Maybe they've got all their blinds closed. Maybe they've got their eyes closed. Jesus is speaking primarily about people who listen to the gospel for salvation. But the four types of listeners, the four types of soils can apply to any people. We need to be willing to open our minds to the word of God, to the spirit of God, to hear what he may have to say to us. So first is the responsibility of the sower. We must sow the field, that's you and I. So. What type of harvest should a farmer expect if he doesn't sow any seed? I think we've got some farmers here. <laughs> you know, I think you know the answer. Don't expect anything. If you're not going to sow the seed, don't expect anything. And so it's my responsibility and yours as a believer to share the love of Jesus and the truth of the gospel with other people. That's your responsibility as well as mine. So, by the way, it brings me great joy to see people trust Christ as Savior. I've seen a lot of people do that through the work, through the years. And, and I've mentioned more than once about uh, the first person I led to faith in Christ. I can still remember. It was over 40 years ago. But it brought joy to my heart. And by the way, he was not of my race. He was of a different race. Uh, and... Uh, it, it just brought, it brings joy to my heart for, to see people come to know Christ. And God can use you as well as me in sharing. You see, we're to be the sowers. That's my responsibility. That's your responsibility. What they do with the word of God is up to them. But I'm a sower and you're to be a sower. I'm to live righteously before the Lord, so they can, and you are too, so they can look at my life and see that God has indeed changed my life. 
Okay, let's move on to the second point. You say, oh, this, this sermon's going to be short. No, don't get too excited. Okay. All right, here's the second point, the responsibility of the seed. The seed is the word of God. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. When we share the word of God with people, the spirit of God can work in their hearts. It may not be evident when we share the word of God that he's at work, but he is as we share the word of God. And if that person is open to the Lord's spirit, God can lead them to salvation. And I have a story to tell about this, but I'm going to wait till the end of the message to, story, to tell the story. So let's move on to the third point, the responsibility of the soil. We're going to spend most of our time here because that's where Jesus speaks the most about, in what he speaks the most about in this parable. He says there are four types of listeners. First of, all, first of all, there's what I call the close-minded, stubborn hearers. Look again at verse 5. The sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell beside the road, and it was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air ate it up. Jesus explains this in verse 12. Those beside the road are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart, so that they will not believe and be saved. Now in Palestine, the land, uh, the fields were laid out in long, narrow strips. I think they're that way around here most of the time. And as uh, the walk, passerbys would walk by, they would harden the ground by walking on it. And of course, uh, underneath the ground could be limestone mm -hmm. rock, and in places, it would only be covered by a thin layer of soil. Other soil would be rich and deep, but it would have thorn bushes in it with a lot of roots. Still, other soil would be rich and deep without the thorn bushes, without the thorn roots. And the sower would walk along in the field and broadcast, throwing out his seed. That's the way they did it back then. Now, the ground beside the road is often hard ground. Please hear me, this is very important. It is possible to hear the word of God and get nothing out of it because your heart is hard. Your heart is hard. So there are people who may come to church or have come to church before. They've heard the word of God preached. They haven't done what they sense God wanted them to do as a result of hearing the word. They continue to have a hard heart. And before long, the word of God really means nothing to them because they, they've hardened their heart. In other words, if you don't use the truth, you can lose the truth. This is true not just with unbelievers, but with believers as well. Christians can hear over and over that they have a responsibility to share the gospel and not do it. And before long, they just don't do it. And they don't pay any attention, it seems, to those verses. Some people do not want to hear the gospel. So why have they closed their minds to the truth? There could be more than one reason. It's possible that they have been led astray by some false teacher. This is not uncommon in our country today for some false teacher to lead people astray, to promise God will do this if you do this, and then they do what the preacher says and God doesn't do what he's supposed to do. So they just stop believing you know, anything a preacher has to say. Others are proud and do not want to admit that they're sinners. If you're going to come to faith in Christ, you've got to be willing to admit that you need forgiveness for your sins. A lot of people don't want to do that. Pride can cause us to be overly concerned about ourselves, and we really can be so concerned about ourselves that we don't do what's best for us, and that is to hear the Word of God and be sure that we know what it's saying and receive it into our hearts. 
Some people have critical spirits as they listen to the word. They refuse to hear what the word of God because they're looking for something to criticize. Um, you know, I, I'm not saying preachers always tell the truth. We just need to be cautious in our hearts that we're not overly judging other people, critical of other people and preachers. Examine what is said according to the word of God. Don't believe everything you hear. But if, our, if we become very critical in our spirits, we can become like Pharisees. So, like many of them were. All right. If you do not act on God's truth, Satan can come and steal the truth and your heart will become hardened to it. That's part of what Jesus is saying here. Is there hope for a person with a closed mind? Yes, there is. Yes, there is. This is great news. If you continue to reject God's will for your life, whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, God may uh, allow you to experience the results of your rejection of his word and you may have financial disaster, health problems, family problems. And God can use all of these to break up the soil so you'll be willing to listen. So there's the closed-minded, stubborn hearers. There's also with what, those what I would call a cl clouded mind, the superficial hearers. Look at verse 6. Other seed fell on rocky soil, and as soon as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. Jesus explains in verse 13, those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no firm root. They believe for a while, and in time of temptation, fall away. Do you know some people who go to church um, and probably have never had a personal relationship with Christ. Again, I'm not to be the judge, but I do wonder about some people. I do wonder. Because there are people that Jesus talks about here that it, it seems like maybe they have some emotional experience or, you know, and, and maybe they're baptized. But then after a while, you can't find them going to church anywhere. And it grieves me. I wonder if that's what's happened here. They received the word with joy, but they had no firm root. They really didn't develop a personal relationship with Christ. Or maybe they did, and then in temptation they fell away. In other words, I'm, I'm trying to be cautious to judge people's hearts. I would ask you to judge your own heart. I don't, I don't want to be a judge. So... But there are people like this, and a plant without moisture will soon die. And a person who seems to accept the gospel, but then they don't grow as a believer, it looks fine at first, but then if the living water does not flow into their heart and they do not spend time in the Word, they're likely going to be a superficial hearer. And again, I don't want to be the judge of anyone. I can't look in someone's heart and see if they're truly a believer or not. I think there are true believers who turn away from the Lord at some point in their life. God graciously still loves them. But I think there are other people who have made some decision, but they really didn't give their life to Christ. There's those with a closed mind, the stubborn hearer, those with a clouded mind, the superficial here, then those are there are those with a cluttered mind. I call these the selfish hearers. Chapter 8, verse 7. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it out. Jesus explains that. By the way, I'm so glad Jesus explains this parable. <laughs> so I, it's not all up to me just to try to figure it out. So he explains it in verse 14. The seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who've heard, and as they go on their way, they are choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to maturity. 
I think it's more than likely that each one of you entered this building this morning with some worries <laughs> or something to worry about. I did. I've got something to worry about. But it's not going to help me to worry about it. Uh, also, Jesus says, riches. Sometimes people make it their goal to get as much money as they can in life. And when they do that, money has become their God. And the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. I think there's a Bible verse about that one. And then Jesus also mentions about pleasures. Some people make it their life's goal to have as much pleasure as they can. Pleasure becomes their God. And there'll come a time when they will greatly be disappointed that they've made that choice. I think this of uh, this uh, cluttered mind as that of a selfish hearer. Some people, I think, tend to come to church for what they can get and not what they can give. God wants us to learn to give as he gives. In order to hear God's word, we need to be in a place where we're listening, where God's word is preached, and we also need to spend time with God's word in the week. Um, oftentimes I think people blame the preacher if they don't get something out of the sermon. Sometimes maybe it is the preacher's fault. Sometimes it's the fault of the soil, those who are listening. Are they getting something out of it? And it's because maybe they're not really listening with an open heart. All right, the fourth type of soil is the committed mind, the surrendered heart. Chapter eight, verse eight. Uh, by the way, God can use any preacher. If, if we're seeking the Lord and want to do what he wants, he used a donkey in the Old Testament. I know he can use me. He can use any preacher. Okay, chapter eight, verse eight. Other, this is uh, the committed mind, the surrendered heart, other seed fell into the good soil and grew up and produced a crop a hundred times as great. Jesus explains in verse 15, but the seed in the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart and hold it fast and bear fruit with perseverance. So those with a closed, clouded, or cluttered mind will not see the truth or at least not retain it but those whose minds are fertile have committed minds. They are surrendered hearts. They're coming to the scriptures honestly. They have a good heart. They want to know the truth. They're not wanting to use the scriptures to justify their sin or to use the scriptures to, for their own benefit. They're coming to the scriptures to want to know the truth. And they continue to come to the scriptures that way. And they continue to come to God's house of worship with a teachable spirit, a teachable heart. They're wanting to listen. They're wanting to learn. And uh, so how can we cultivate a fertile soil in our lives? How can we make our hearts and minds receptive and our lives fruitful? Some years ago, on, uh, I, I was involved with a Christian camp up in the Northeast in New York State. And on, on Monday, on, pardon me, on Sunday, the kids would come in, Sunday after church, the kids would come into camp and, and it would be about a week long. They would leave on Saturday. And one of the first things they did on Sunday, when the kids got there, the counselors would ask them a question. What question would you like our, our, our guest speaker, one of our guest speakers to answer this week? And so they'd have a list of questions that the kids wanted to have answered. And then they, <laughs> they let me know on Monday generally what all those questions were or when they had the whole list together. Uh, I'm glad I had a day or two to pray about it and think about it, you know. And so here was one of the questions that one of the kids asked. How do I know if it's my voice or Jesus' voice 
in my head. How do I know? Now here's part of what I said to you. Commit to seek God with an honest heart and you'll be more likely to hear his voice. It will not be an audible voice, but it'll be a strong conviction about something based on what the word of God says. And then I'll share with them this passage from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the will of God is. And I also told them to commit to study God's word. The Spirit of God will not lead us to do something contrary to God's word. And also to commit to seek godly wisdom. Proverbs eleven fourteen says, But in abundance of counselors there is victory. Ask your mom and dad, especially if they're Christians, ask them what they believe this verse is telling them, telling you. And, and talk with your preacher or someone at church about what the verse is saying. And I shared with them, it would be good to bow your head every day in prayer and say, Lord, I commit my life to you afresh today. I want to fully surrender my life to you. Help me listen to your voice. And I think I said, trust God and don't be a worry wart. All right? Every day, read God's word, ask his spirit to evaluate your life and seek to change your life according as he shows you in his word. Now, that's the responsibility of the sower to be faithful in sharing God's word. I hope you're doing that because that's something God's called you to do. Second, the responsibility of the seed God will be faithful to honor his word. And third, the responsibility of the soil. We're to be faithful to receive God's word. Honestly, seek to know what God wants as we study his word. A preacher can be incorrect. The word of God is not incorrect. <clears throat> and finally, Jesus says in chapters, uh, chapter 8, verses 16 through 18, no one lights a lamp and then covers it. God wants you to serve him and be a light to those around you. And then he concludes with this warning in chapter 8, verses 17 and 18. Nothing is hidden that will not become evident, nor anything secret that will but not be known and come to light. So take care how you listen. For whoever has, to him more shall be given. And whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has, should be taken away from him. So God is speaking. Are you listening? Are you listening? Now, I want to share with you a story. This is a true story. We had a student at the Northeast campus from the Ukraine. His name was Oleg Serebotsky. I'm not sure where he is now. You know, it's been a few years since I've seen him. But I want to read to you his testimony because it illustrates some of the teaching of this passage. Okay? This is what he says. When I was a young man, I had a... And by the way, he was uh, uh, in the Ukraine when the Soviet Union was in power. He said, when I was a young man, I was fond of sketching trees, rocks, and other things of nature. As I sketched these pictures, I began to question how they came in uh, to be. Sometimes I felt like the only one on earth looking for answers. I lived in a Soviet society where science was God. It left no place for thought about a creator. They said that religion was from the dark ages and primitive. I began to ask my friend these questions. They laughed and ridiculed me. I asked my teachers these questions, and they had no answers. I asked my family these questions, and they had no answers. I felt an emptiness. I would go out at night and look up at the stars and know that there was something or someone else that created them. All this took a process of about two years. Finally, a fellow student told me I should look to philosophy for answers. He sent me to a library that had formerly been a monastery. 
A librarian brought me books on Indian and Chinese philosophy. I spent hours reading them. I also read Aristotle, Plato, Socrates. But to put together my own philosophy, I wrote many notebooks using only the information given to me by the librarian. When I'd finished, my own philosophy still left me with questions. As I grew older, my questions changed to where did I come from? Where am I going? Why am I here? What purpose do I have? Finally, the librarian told me, I found a book in the philosophy section that I've never given to you. It's been misplaced for years. It was a Slavic Bible. Even as I held it, I felt that the answers were there. I began to read the Old Testament first, then I began to read the New Testament. It was here that I found Jesus who answered all of my questions. Only Jesus spoke of love. All the other religious systems spoke of power and self-centeredness. I received his word by the Holy Spirit and changed my heart. From the beginning of my believing, I began to continually witness about the Lord and his word to everybody I met. My heart burned to tell people about God and his son. Now I, who was the one who had questions, became the one who had the answers. I was always known as a sad person. Now I became a happy person. People saw that I had changed. Because of this change, I was reported to the KJV. They wanted to know where I got my answers. I told them from the library. They insisted that this was not true. When I told them the books that I had read, they insisted that either the FBI or the CIA had given me these books. They found all the notebooks I had written and took them from me. They found the Bible that I had been reading and took it from the library but it made no difference. I'd already memorized about 10 chapters from the book of Matthew. My mother was a respected teacher. My father was a high ranking military officer. Their careers came to an end because I became a Christian. They were questioned by the KGB as well. They asked me to renounce my faith and I refused. The KGB even took me to a prison hospital where I was kept for weeks and asked questions. They gave me shock treatments and injections, which made me unconscious, but I would never renounce my faith. I could not because it was true. When I finally went home, my father was required to read atheistic indoctrination to me for hours a day. I learned how to hear what he said, but turn it off and think on Jesus and recall all the verses I had memorized. This lasted about three years. They were always asking that I renounce my faith. Occasionally the KGB would come by to see if I had renounced my faith. The Lord gave me the possibility to serve as a missionary in different places. He allowed me to minister throughout the Ukraine and Estonia. I had the joy of leading my wife, Jelena, to Christ in Estonia. Sometimes I worked to establish churches. Other times I would organize and strengthen churches because there was much false teaching and heresy. This worried the KGB. They decided it would be better if I was not there, so they let me come to America. I came to America about three years ago, long before Perestroika. I remember the last talk with my father. After all the reading that he had done and all the talks that we had, the last thing he said before I left was, Son, I do believe that there is something higher than we are. Maybe it is God, but I don't want to believe in your God. Some may think this was a discouraging statement, but I rejoiced in that he admitted to something else. My mother is now living with me, Jelena, and our three children in Schenectady, New York. She is very close to accepting the Lord. My father will soon be coming to live with me. I'm looking forward to hearing them both confess that Jesus is that God. Now, I don't know how things went for Oleg and his family. But you can see, when someone with an open heart hears the word of God, reads the word of God, God can speak to their hearts. And in the midst of all this persecution, he stayed faithful to the Lord. May God help us to be that type of believer. I'm thankful we don't have a lot of persecution in our land right now. Let's be faithful in sharing the word of God with others. Would you bow with me in prayer? But I'm thankful again for each one here, each one that might listen later on online. 
Lord, I pray that you would help us to be willing to do what you want. Help us to hear when we read the word, when we listen to the preacher, whether it's me or someone else. Help us that we'll hear what you want us to hear. Check it out with your word. Be sure that what you're calling us to do is what you want. And then help us to obey and commit ourselves fully to you. Well, let's keep our head bowed. In just a moment, we'll have a time of prayer and a time of invitation. If someone wants to uh, join the fellowship of our church, you can do so by transfer of letter, by statement of faith, and baptism if necessary. Just uh, if, if God is leading you to do that, I encourage you to do it. We would welcome you, but I want you most of all to do what God wants. So Lord, may you have your way during this time of invitation. And I pray especially if there's someone here, I trust everyone is a believer, but if there's someone here who's not really given their life to Christ, I pray they would do so today. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me?